It is now my pleasure to welcome past President Tom Sullivan, President and CEO of Jefferson Development Corporation, to the rostrum. Tom, secure today's speaker. Thank you. Please take a minute to introduce us to Robert Bonner and the important message that he will share today. Did you notice he said, please take a minute? <laughs> no more than a minute. It is my pleasure to introduce a longtime friend and a neighbor, Robert C. Bonner. Robert is a senior principal of Sentinel uh, HS Group and a former partner of Gibson W. Crutcher, where he now serves as counsel. As many of you know, he has spoken to this club before. You can tell by it seems like all only he knows half the room. So if this information is important to you, please be good and don't say it. This guy is a, he's kind of a super G man. He's a, he's been in all aspects of national security, border patrol. He was an appointment of uh, George W. Bush Sr. and uh, George Bush Sr. Herbert Walker Sr. to the uh, the uh, Border Patrol, no, to the DEA, and then George Bush, George W. Bush, to the uh, uh, Customs and Border Patrol. He has uh, been an attorney, uh, U.S. attorney for the California Central District, numerous other organizations. To find what he has to say, fascinating, and I might say, a bit frightening. I don't know how he does all this. He's uh, back and forth to Washington. He has all these jobs. He's also on the board of Caltech, and he has additional duties there as uh, the audit and the compliance commission on that board. His background is so lengthy, and I won't go through the Toto Tanaka situation for those of you who know about it. Is who choose whatever, you know. But uh, what he's going to tell you is not going to be happy news for you in this time of worldwide political unrest and territorial spread. There is nobody more qualified to bring us current on what to expect in the future regarding our national security outlook. Rob, we're looking forward to your message.
And that's the threat posed by the growing connection between organized crime and international terrorist organizations. In thinking about the subject, uh, the horror movies of my youth came to mind. Because I remember there were, uh, uh, apparently for Hollywood, it was not enough just to have one monster menacing communities. There were a, a gaggle of movies, some of you might be old enough to recall, that featured more than one monster joining forces to wreak havoc on global populations. Frankenstein meets Dracula. Dracula meets the werewolf, and so on. And I thought about this as I considered the title of my remarks today. And the title is Global Jihad Meets Organized Crime, A National Security Nightmare Come True. I've got a question mark there because that's what we're going to discuss this afternoon. But let me start with a story, and it's a remarkable story. The headline of this story, by the way, could be Hezbollah Meets the Mexican Drug Cartels. In the last several years, the Mexican drug cartels began looking to expand their market for cocaine. And this will surprise some of you, by the way, but there has actually has been a declining consumption of cocaine in the United States over the last number of years. And so the Mexican cartels turned to Europe to make up this market shortfall. And for this, they needed to develop a new pipeline, a new trade route uh, to get cocaine into Europe. And they essentially set up, the Mexican cartel set up a transshipment route from Colombia through Venezuela to West Africa and then to Europe. The Mexican cartels had suppliers in Colombia for cocaine, principally the FARC, um, a, a designated terrorist organization, by the way, of the United States government. Um, and uh, they had facilitators in Venezuela, a Marxist government that is We'll see what happens after the demise now of Hugo Chavez, but a Marxist government that is brilliantly anti-American and given, by the way, to a fairly huge amount of corruption at high levels. So the, the straight route through Venezuela is not a problem. Um, from South America, the loads of cocaine are shipped to some very weak and corrupt West African nations that are bought off pretty cheaply by the Mexican cartel operatives. And from there, all quantities of cocaine, and I'm talking about literally thousands of metric tons at a time, uh, thousands of kilos at a time, are smuggled into Europe. But the Mexican cartels had a problem. And the problem is they needed to get control of their cash, their revenues, that were generated from these illegal drug sales. Enter Hezbollah a state-sponsored international terrorist organization based in Lebanon, as you know, that has cells around the world. And for a sizable percentage of the dirty drug money, Hezbollah began to launder hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of illegal drug profits for the Mexican drug cartels. An intermediary used by Hezbollah was the Lebanese Canadian Bank in Beirut. This horse, a connection between a state-sponsored terrorist organization and the Mexican cartels, played out for several, several years until exposed by a DEA investigation that culminated in indictments last year of Hezbollah operatives and the shutting down of the Lebanese Canadian Bank by the U.S. Treasury Department. It's estimated, though, that Hezbollah laundered as much as $200 million a month for the Mexican drug cartels, of which Hezbollah itself pocketed a sizable percentage, tens of millions of dollars annually, estimated to be a roughly 10% of all the money that they were laundering for the Mexican cartels. And these fees for drug money laundering, in turn, were used by Hezbollah uh, to, among other things, finance their far-flung terrorist organization, whose tentacles extend into South America and into the United States as well. Indeed, as you know, Hezbollah, as a surrogate of Iran, and long supported by Iran, is fighting right now in Syria alongside and to keep the regime of Assad in power. 
Hezbollah has, has far more supporters and operatives in the United States, I'm afraid to tell you, than Al Qaeda ever had or ever dreamed of having. The point that should not be lost is that Hezbollah, the party of God, that's what Hezbollah means, is directly involved in profits from cocaine trafficking big time. One DEA agent involved in the investigation compared Hezbollah to the Mafia saying, Hezbollah operates like the Gambinos on steroids. Well, if this doesn't send some chills up your spine, I'm not sure anything will. But let's back up for a moment and take a look at the phenomena of the transnational crime terrorism nexus. We're seeing several manifestations of this phenomenon. First, there is the criminalization of terrorist organizations. By that I mean terrorist organizations morphing into large transnational criminal organizations. Second, transnational criminal organizations are using terrorist tactics to gain their ends. And third, the terrorist organizations, terrorist organizations are joining forces with organized crime. There's a fourth permutation to this, uh, and that is that state actors such as Iran and Venezuela are joining forces with organized crime and supporting terrorist groups. This is truly the Frankenstein meets Dracula meets Godzilla scenario. And it is, I submit, the most worrisome from a national security perspective. Now, speaking of states or nations, no discussion of the subject would be complete without noting that both organized crime and global terrorist organizations exploit statelessness. And by that I mean a country or areas of a country that are not actually under the control of their own government, either because the state and its law enforcement and criminal justice institutions are too weak, or because the state itself, or at least certain areas of the state, you might be thinking Mexico now, certain areas of the state are so thoroughly intimidated or corrupted, or worse, a state that actually buys into the ideological objectives of the terrorist group as was the case, by the way, of the Taliban pre-9-11 without Taliban. <coughs> so we start with terrorist organizations morphing into criminal organizations. And perhaps the, the clearest example of this, of a terrorist or an insurgent group becoming predominantly a criminal organization, is the FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, a Marxist guerrilla group based in Colombia. Over the years, the FARC has become heavily dependent on criminal activities for most of its revenue. Back in the heyday, by the way, of the Colombian cartels in the 1990s, uh, the FARC controlled a considerable percentage of the rural area of Colombia. The government of Colombia didn't control it, the FARC controlled it. This is 40 to 50 percent of the whole territory of Colombia was controlled by, by the FARC as recently as about 10, 15 years ago. Essentially, the FARC uh, levied attacks on coca growers and fees to protect cocaine labs, laboratory processing labs uh, in the jungle or the rural areas of Colombia for the, for the Colombian cartels. By the late 1990s, after the Medellin and Cali cartel were dismantled and fractured into many pieces, the Mexican drug cartels became the biggest drug trafficking organizations in the world. And they hired FARC basically as a source of supply for cocaine, initially for the U.S. market, and as I mentioned just a moment ago, now more recently, also for the European market as well. More and more, the FARC began to look like and act like a criminal organization, more interested in sustaining itself and its leadership through criminal activity than actually fomenting the Marxist revolution and taking control of the Colombian government. Uh, so the FARC now, I think, is correctly viewed as primarily a service organization for the world's largest drug trafficking organizations based in Mexico. But also worrisome is the fact that from an ideological point of view, the FARC is supported by the Venezuelan government and other anti-American Bolivarian states, including Bolivia and Ecuador. With Chavez's death, by the way, it's unclear what Venezuela's role is going to be going forward. Hope springs eternal, of course. Uh, but the good news is that our ally, Colombia, has the bark on the run. Colombia, with U.S. assistance, has regained control over substantial areas that had been under the control of the FARC. In fact, 
just a few days ago, one entire FARC regiment surrendered to the Colombian authorities. It remains to be seen, by the way, of what the, uh, what's going to come of the negotiations between the Colombian government, the Santos government, and the FARC that are taking place right now and have been for the last couple month or two in Havana. And whether at long last the FARC will lay down their arms and become part of the democratic process within Colombia. The FARC, though, if it's not an out and out criminal organization, is the archetypal hybrid terrorist criminal organization. Which takes me to my second example of a hybrid, and that's the criminalization of Al Qaeda. Uh, the best example of this is Al Qaeda in the Mogherin. AQIM, as it is known, is Al Qaeda's affiliate in North Africa. But I wonder if Bin Laden himself might be rolling over in his watery grave if he knew that AQIM funds its entire operations through crime, mainly kidnapping. Uh, of course, Al Qaeda of Iraq and other affiliate raises funds by, among other things, robbing banks and Al Shabaab in Somalia, another Al Qaeda affiliate, is involved in drug money laundering and other crimes. Uh, all this uh, all this has happened is funds from traditional donors to Al Qaeda some years ago. Wealthy Saudis. They dried up, they disappeared. And as the US, by the way, this is important, a weak African state to be sure. But how was AQIM, AQIM, how was it able to do this? How was it able to finance itself, be able to capture essentially half of a country? Statelessness. Simply put, the Western European countries bankrolled AQIM, AQIM Al Qaeda, and the Muslim. They did this with ransom payments for their citizens kidnapped by AQIM and its affiliates. Just in the last several years, European nations, and I'm talking about France, Germany, Netherlands, Italy, have paid something like $130 million to obtain the release of kidnap victims. AQM, AQIM has made a fortune out of kidnapping Europeans in North Africa. And that ransom money goes to AQIM's treasury and it is used to do what? Purchase weapons, telecommunication equipment, bribe officials, and recruit and train terrorist operatives. Recently, as you know, the French military had to go in and try to root out AQMI, AQIM from its base in northern Mali. The front. The, uh, the U.S., we think, supports this effort, at least from a distance. But the plain and undeniable fact is that this became necessary because AQIM was able to finance itself through kidnappings and take control of a good chunk of Mali. Not to mention, by the way, the capture of an oil refinery in southern Algeria a few months ago. In the U.S., we learned the hard way not to negotiate with terrorists. Uh, unfortunately, the question is, when will our European allies learn this simple lesson? Now let me turn to transnational criminal organizations using terrorist tactics, number two, to achieve their ends. Some think that this was a pretty recent development, but it isn't exactly new. Back in 1990, about 1990, when I was the head of the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Medellin cartel, led by Pablo Escobar, placed a bomb on board a, jet, a commercial jetliner that was flying from Bogota to Cali, killing all 132 people who were on board that plane. And just like terrorists, the Medellin cartel also carried out a, a, drove a very large truck bomb in front of the DOS headquarters, DAS, that's the Colombian Internal Security Agency, or intelligence agency. It's a 10-story building in downtown Bogota, where it exploded, it was exploded, and killed 50 people, and injured over a thousand. The bomb blew away the entire front half of the building. The actions of the Medellin cartel back then gave rise to a new word in the English language, narco-terrorism. This type of terrorism is not geared to causing a government to fall, as with ideologically driven terrorism, but like ideological terrorist acts, it is aimed at intimidating and paralyzing the government and hoping that the big public becomes weary so that the government will allow these criminal organizations to operate with impunity. 
currently one of the Mexican cartels, I mean right now, one of the Mexican cartels called Los Zetas is nearly as violent and brutal as the Medellin cartel. The Zetas, by the way, had been the paramilitary or enforcement arm of the Gulf Cartel until about three years ago when they split them off from the Gulf Cartel. Um, and I would say right now they're one of the two most powerful and violent criminal organizations in the world. Um, they perpetrated an extraordinary amount of carnage in Mexico. Beheaded bodies, uh, mass grave sites, uh, of illegal migrants from Central America attempting to pass through Mexico evidently without paying the required tribute to the owner of these corridors, the Zetas. The executions are far more grisly and barbaric than I want to go into here, but suffice it to say that government officials, mayors, chiefs of police, police officers, even journalists who do not play ball with the Zetas have been targeted and murdered. Their torsos hang from highway overpasses with messages affixed to them. Many of the most grisly murders are rival cartel members. The Zetas have even used improvised explosive devices, IEDs, reminiscent, isn't it, of the insurgent tactics in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they've rolled hand grenades. Any of you know this, really? They've rolled a hand grenade into the U.S. consulate compound in Monterey, Mexico. And they've also rolled hand grenades into press offices, the El Mañana newspaper and Nuevo Laredo. Uh, they have sophisticated weapons, by the way, not just grenades, they have rocket launchers. And they've set fire to a casino in Monterey that declined to pay the required extortion, killing 52 people in the process. They were burned alive. The Zetas have extended their violence their, 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 their pattern here of mayhem and murder into Guatemala and other countries of Central America. And where they're, they're even weaker law enforcement and criminal justice systems than Mexico. The Zetas then are the prototypal narco terrorist organization. Now let me turn to the third category, and that's state actors. Because when you throw nations that are state actors into this mix, you've got a very dangerous, a much more dangerous soup one that becomes a tier one, I would submit, national security threat. And we've had some glimpses into this trouble phenomenon. Perhaps the most astonishing, I think, is the connection that occurred recently, not, not that long ago, with the Iranian government, where the government of Iran contracted, contacted and contracted with a Mexican drug cartel for the purpose of having the cartel hitmen carry out a terrorist attack in the United States. Uh, not even Hollywood could dream of such a bizarre plot. Uh, by way of background, the external arm of the Iran's elite revolutionary guard is known as the Quds Force. You will not be tested later on this, but it's the Quds Force. And it's been designated as a, by the U.S. government as a terrorist organization. The Quds Force, by the way, is believed to have contracted some time and some years ago with the with Libyan intelligence uh, to plant a bomb on board Pan Am 103 that killed 270 people, mainly Americans, back in 1988. Although Iran's involvement with Pan Am 103 was not known until many years later. The attack, by the way, on Pan Am 103 was ordered as retaliation for the U.S. accidentally shooting down an Iranian commercial jetliner over the Persian Gulf five months earlier in July. The, uh, I, I could mention also the 1994 bombing of the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires. Uh, that was uh, planned and financed by the Cuts Force and carried out by Hezbollah, according to the Argentine Special Prosecutor that investigated the matter. <laughs> but let's go more recently. Not long ago, the Cuts Force sought out and contacted the Zetas in Mexico. The Iranian government, through an Iranian intermediary, wanted the Saudi ambassador to the United States assassinated. And they did not want Iranian fingerprints to be on this, or even his Hezbollah fingerprints, which would be traced back to it. The plan to kill the Saudi ambassador was discussed in detail, and 
essentially involved placing a bomb in a restaurant in Washington, D.C., frequented by the ambassador. Needless to say, quite a few people were likely to be killed, innocent people, in that bomb blast, not just the ambassador. So why didn't this happen? Why was this Iranian government agency that made a connection with organized crime in Mexico not successful? And the reason is quite simple. The person in Los Zetas in Mexico contacted by the Cuts Force intermediary was a DEA undercover informant. And of course, DEA was informed and the conspir conspiratorial discussions were reported and the intermediary was traced right back to the Cuts Force in Iran, as was the $150,000 cash down payment that was wire transferred to the Los Zetas undercover person. By the way, it's in the newspaper today, the Iranian intermediary was sentenced to 25 years in prison in the Federal District Court of the Southern District of New York. So fortunately, this plot was, was for uh, But if you doubt that this organized crime terrorism connection uh, is, a, you know, if you doubt that it's a, a significant national security concern, I consider that there have been offers by Russian organized crime to sell so-called suitcase nukes and missile material to Al-Qaeda. So far, fortunately, Russian organized crime seems more interested in defrauding Al-Qaeda than actually supplying them with rich uranium. So far. The potential of a state actor arming and using terrorist, the terrorist organization as a means to carry out asymmetric warfare against the U.S., though, is real. Especially, for example, Iran using Hezbollah for, certain per for that purpose under certain circumstances. And if they could use a criminal organization as a cutout, I mean, so much the better from their point of view. With the Mexican drug cartels, let me just ask you, rhetorically anyway, with the, which are engaged in criminal activity from drug trafficking, extortion, human smuggling, and kidnapping, uh, would they draw the line if they were offered a handsome fee to smuggle a dozen or so terrorist operatives across the Mexican border into the United States? So what, what should we, what should the United States government do about this threat? Uh, at a minimum, understanding and combating this threat requires a whole government approach. Because there's no one U.S. agency that has the responsibility for or is tasked with confront or even is pulling together a complete intelligence picture with respect to this threat. The organized crime, hyphen, drug trafficking, hyphen, terrorist division of labor in our own federal government agencies doesn't work very well to address the problem these, that these hybrid organizations present. And of course, that is the problem. We somehow have to organize ourselves to respond to these new hybrid organizations far better than we're currently organized. In our government, major drug trafficking organizations are typically the principal responsibility of the DEA, whereas terrorist organizations that operate domestically or threaten the U.S. homeland are the responsibility of the FBI. And the CIA is responsible for understanding and reacting to terrorist organizations operating against U.S. interests abroad. This all gets pretty, there's some others agencies that play in this game too, but this all gets pretty blurry when Frankenstein meets the world, when major international drug trafficking organizations have arrangements with international terrorist organizations, some of whom are sponsored by states that are adversarial to the United States. It raises the question, who's in charge here? Or put perhaps better, is there anybody in charge? Uh, so fighting that terrorist, this emerging threat, is not just about combating ideology and jihadism, it's about understanding and combating transnational organizations and increases, as is increasing the case, terrorist organizations that participate in criminal networks or engage in crime to finance their terrorist activity. Ironically, this could be an opportunity because one of the strengths of U.S. law enforcement is that the U.S. government, DEA and the FBI, are really good in about dismantling criminal enterprises. Now the point is it's time to get out of our silos when it comes to the terrorism, drug trafficking, organized crime nexus, and to put it in place a multi-agency, multinational strategy involving law enforcement, intelligence, and counterterrorism elements. 
So we need a strategy. It needs to be orchestrated out of the National Security Council staff, I believe, that organizes as, as effectively and nimbly as transnational organized crime and terrorist organizations have organized themselves in their marriage of convenience. A strategy that draws heavily on what we've learned about attacking and dismantling major drug trafficking organizations and other criminal groups. It's high time we get started on this. If we fail, we will, I'm afraid, regret not having taken action. Thank you.
place since 1979. Iran is an enemy of the United States, and we're fooling ourselves if we don't know that. I mean, we don't even want to admit that this is the country that brought down Pan Am 103, right? We don't want to admit it because of the implications, I think, from that. But um, the reality is, uh, no, I don't, look, I'm not saying you shouldn't periodically grow and give some things a try. I don't, uh, I would not be optimistic at all that we're going to be successful in negotiating anything, whether that's uh, not uh, developing nuclear weapons or any other kind of uh, appropriate behavior from the current regime of the Ask President Tom. Uh, Rob, uh, we have a lot of major corporations that are doing business in Mexico and adding to Mexico's G and P. I would think that is it possible that maybe they could put some pressure on the new government to do something because they are adding to their economy. Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. Yeah, there, the situation in Mexico, of course, uh, in terms of violence and the mayhem of the cartels, particularly the cartel wars fighting each other, you know, hasn't been in every area of Mexico, but there's no question that having <laughs> organized crime that is that has the power and grip that, let's say, the Sinaloa cartel and the Zetas have over the Mexican government, is one thing that's a disincentive to investment. Uh, has eliminated investment in Mexico, but Mexico will never reach its full potential economically until it actually vanquishes these powerful organized crime groups and establishes finally the rule of law in Mexico and ends the era of impunity. Sir. First, thank you for coming and spending your time with us. Uh, I want to be coming on two things. Uh, a substantial portion of law enforcement community supports the legalization of of drugs, with the idea of saying that well, we're not going to stop it. Second, you cut cash flow, and third, you increase government revenues. Second thing to comment on is the U.S. government has, on a number of occasions, used the mafia to advance its own interests. Well, the mafia is gone. I hate to tell you, but I mean, the FBI took care of that about 10, 15, 20 years ago. I'm not serious. I mean, the Gambino family, the family in Chicago, Detroit, the Zarellis, so forth, the Savellis in, uh, in Kansas City. I mean, the the U.S. Mafia is a, it's a laughing stock. I'm not saying you know, it doesn't exist at all, but it's not the kind of threat it was in the 50s when you had the Appalachian meeting and the Keyfolder hearings and so on. So that's number one. But have we ever collaborated with the Mafia? I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, we could go back into history and, uh, you know, <laughs> cast through on that stuff. But, uh, but the legalization issue, look, that's a profound issue. Uh, I can spend the rest of the afternoon debating that with you. But let me just say this. If you look at it from the point of view of uh, uh, could we possibly cut the revenues of the Mexican cartels by legalizing the sale and distribution of methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, and so forth, which are their main drugs of profit, it's just marijuana, it's those hard drugs. Yeah, you, you could cut the revenues, but I mean, as a matter of policy for the United States government, uh, you tell me how many more meth heroin, cocaine addicts, cokeheads, they're going to be in American society, what impact that's going to have on our, and just on our competitiveness as a nation. And maybe we can have a meaningful discussion, but I think that would be incredibly bad policy for the U.S. Now, said that, look, there's an issue on marijuana. It's uh, Marijuana is uh, not as harmful, it's not as addictive, doesn't uh, have the byproduct of producing a lot of crime as coke and crack and meth and so forth too. You can debate that. I mean, I still come down on the side that I think that would be unwise. Certainly, by the way, some people argue, well, the hurt Mexican cartels. Well, maybe the RAND study estimate is that about 4% of the profits of the cartels come from marijuana sales. I mean, okay, so it's not going to have any effect on the cartels. Now, is it a good thing or a bad thing as a matter of public policy in the U.S.? It's debatable. I'm not here to say people are, you know, uh, that it's an outrageous position to take, and maybe it's going to happen. We've had two states now for the first time in the history of our country, Colorado and the state of Washington, that have passed uh, initiatives to legalize not just the possession, but the production, cultivation, and distribution, wholesale and retail of marijuana. I tend to think we're going to find out that wasn't a good idea. We'll see. Arthur. How you doing, sir? Uh, we've known each other for a long time. First of all, I think that President Obama should have 
name you the next director of the FBI. That's my own personal opinion. Uh, I think you're the most qualified guy for the job. Uh, the one thing that I've seen over the years is that there are so many $100 bills in circulation. I don't even think the government has a clue as to how much has been printed and how much is out there. And if there was an effort to change the color of the $100 bills, making some kind of...